All right, thank you, Les, and thank you again. Um, if the last presentation was broad, um, this one's gonna be very narrow, okay? So I think I hit just about every system of thinking that's out there in the last presentation. This one's gonna be much more focused and um, on target in terms of what we'll be talking about. I mean, in April of 2021, the initial episode of a new podcast called The Pactum released. And the title of the, the pilot episode of this podcast was Reformed Dispensationalism. And the host of the podcast was a man named Matthew Johnston. Am I getting a slide up there? Okay, there might be a delay. There, it is. there we go. I think we're on target now. And um, Matthew Johnson is the pastor of Riverbend Bible Church in, in New Zealand. He's a graduate of the Master's Seminary. And two of his guests on this inaugural episode of this podcast were assistant professors of theology at the Master's Seminary, uh, Dr. Michael Riccardi and Dr. Peter Sammons. Now, the, the premise and, and the purpose of this podcast episode was to advance a new theological idea, a new concept that these men were now calling Reformed Dispensationalism. In fact, if you go to the first show notes of that first episode, that, that maiden voyage of the episode, you'll see the following, I think, eye-catching statement where they say, witness the birth of Reformed dispensationalism. <laughs> now, I will say right out of the gate that I'm, I'm personally a little touchy, a, a little squeamish, a little reluctant to simply jump in with both feet to, to any new theological movement uh, or camp or way or approach. Uh, when anything new starts to form. Um, I'm even more reluctant when, as was the case here, the proponents of this new mo movement simply declare its own existence. Um, Solomon from Ecclesiastes, you remember, infamously declared, there is nothing new under the sun. Um, I'm going to go with that line of, of thinking when it comes to new methods uh, of doing theology, uh, new ways of theological interpretation, and the legitimacy of new theological movements. I'd be, I think we'd all be wise to keep that reminder. Well, that podcast episode from April of 2021 was a, a singular episode of what was uh, then called the Pactum Podcast, a podcast named after the Pactum Salutis, uh, the Latin term for the covenant of redemption, which is one of the three theological covenants of, of covenant theology. And I listened to that episode back in April of 2021. I listened to what the host, Matthew Johnston, and his guests, Drs. Riccardi and Sammons, had to say and I wasn't really persuaded by any of it. Um, but honestly, I sort of let it go. I didn't really think much more about it. There was just that one episode, and I figured it had gone off into the ether and nothing more needed to be said. That all changed six months ago, when in July of 2023, that the same trio released a second episode aptly titled Reform Dispensationalism Part Two. Now, if you want to find either one of those episodes, by the way, you can find them no longer under the Pactum podcast. They realized later on that their podcast had the same title as Pat Avendroth's podcast, the, the Pactum. And so they changed the name of their podcast to No Lasting City. So if you want to find either episode of the Reform Dispensationalism podcast, you have to find it here at No Lasting City. Um, in any event, in part two of Reform Dispensationalism, podcast episode number two, these three men really doubled down on their conception of what they're now calling reform dispensationalism. Um, I listened to the episode. Uh, in fact, I listened to both episodes multiple times. So make, to make sure I understood what was being said and understood what was being proposed. And also so that I could understand fairly what was not being said. So as not to unfairly leap to any wrong conclusions or wrongly ascribe bad motives to anybody on that podcast. I even had both episodes transcribed so that I could engage with the written word and process what was being said in, in both of those episodes. And I've got to say, after doing all of that, um, what I heard confused me, uh, what I heard concerned me, and what I heard convinced me that, that some form of response was required. Now, this morning's presentation is my response. And it's really not my response to Matthew Johnston or Drs. Riccardi or, or Sammons, more broadly, it's my response to this whole idea of what's being proposed now as, as reformed dispensationalism. Now, there are some cards I should put on the table right at the, the front here before we go any further. And the first card I want to put on the table is, um, as I've already mentioned and as has been mentioned, I'm a master's man 
Um, I got my MDiv at Master's Seminary. I pursued about halfway through my, my THM at Master's Seminary before transferring here to STS to finish that degree. Um, I love the Master's Seminary. I've been greatly benefited by and influenced by Master's Seminary. I've been deeply impacted, as many of us have been, by the ministry of John MacArthur. And I do believe that my pastoral ministry, my preaching ministry, is really the fruit in many ways of what I, how I was trained there. So I do share that to say I share a sense of kinship with these men, uh, even if we might disagree theologically. Um, second, I want to mention this, that, that all three of the men that I will quote here today are, are relative strangers to me. I, I don't know Matthew Johnston. We had brief interaction in writing leading up to this presentation. That's it. Um, I don't know Peter Sammons. I think he and I emailed once or twice about a, a Master Seminary Journal article I was going to contribute at some point when he was the editor there. Um, I've interacted a couple times with, with Mike Riccardi, but not on these matters, on, on other theological matters. Um, but I start by acknowledging that these men are brothers in the Lord. They are serious students of his word. They're respected in various circles. And I will say of Dr. Riccardi that I think he is one of the most gifted and eloquent preachers I've ever heard. So let that be said. Um, third, I do believe that the public statements that these, these men have made in this podcast setting, which is kind of the modern version of theological discourse these days, um, in attempting to name or, or, or identify this new system of theology called Reformed Dispensationalism, I do believe their public statements warrant a public response. Uh, this isn't a matter of sin, where I'm supposed to go first to my brother and confront him privately about his sin. This is a matter of open theological discourse. And the Reformed Dispensationalists have fired off the first volley. So it's fair game to, in, in like manner, reply publicly and, and push back uh, theologically. So those are the cards, uh, the cards that are on the table. And I want to make clear that my goal here this morning is not to be snide or dismissive, but it's to lay out some real concerns I have over this, this advent, this promotion of what's now being called reform dispensationalism. By the way, this novel um, theological idea that I keep mentioning that, that was birthed on this podcast. It's also, if you do some searching in the Twitterverse, I guess it's X now, um, there's more being said about this in social media as well. There's even a website uh, put out by Andrew Young, who is the associate pastor of Matthew Johnston there in, in New Zealand, called Dispensational Federalism, which is a, a, a hat tip to the fact that they subscribe to the 1689 London Baptist Confession. And I'll, I'll come back to this quote later, but on that website, uh, Mr. Young, Pastor Young, says every self-respecting dispensationalist should consider themselves a covenant theologian. Now, that's not like a cutesy way of saying like a biblical covenantalist, which we'll get into later. Um, we'll, we'll explore this in just a moment. The, the point for now, though, is that this is a movement that is gaining some degree of momentum. How much still remains to be seen. But I really do believe before it picks up more steam, um, it's open to and it's worthy of public challenge and, and public criticism, which is what this uh, second session is going to be. Now, as far as how this is going to go, let me lay out a bit of a roadmap about what I'm going to try to cover here. Uh, I'm going to start by, and I'm, I'm going to, I get this is going to be very basic. Um, I'm going to go through some core tenets and presuppositions, respectively, of reform theology and dispensationalism. Now, for most of you, this won't be new. This will be by way of review. But to set up our discussion of reformed dispensationalism and what these gentlemen are contending for, it's important that we go back to the basics of defining basic terms. What is reformed theology? What are some of its core beliefs and presuppositions? And in like manner, what is dispensationalism? What are some of its core beliefs and presuppositions? I'm going to have to necessarily paint with broad strokes to, to accomplish that task. So if you think I'm leaving out some key aspect of reformed theology or dispensationalism in this presentation, you're right. I am. <laughs> Um, after that, I'll take us through some of the history of the interactions between Reformed theologians and dispensational theologians. And, and what we're going to see through the words of Reformed and dispensational theologians alike is how wide the gulf between these camps truly is and how divergent these two systems of theology really are. And then after that, that'll all be the setup. Um, after that, I'll, I'll then put the words of the Reformed Dispensationalist, Matthew Johnson, Michael McCarty, Peter Sammons, up on the screen. And these are their words, uh, words which are expressing how they are conceiving of this new theological framework they're promoting. And I'm going to put their words up here again, not to be sensational, but to be factual. 
so that we can respond biblically and theologically to what's being promoted. And then I'll close by making the case that the, the whole con conception of reform dispensationalism is, is fundamentally flawed. And there are too many red flags. There are too many areas of conflict. It, it doesn't work. That's why I've labeled it the message uh, a bridge too far. It's a bridge too far. All right, as we get into the, the heart of the presentation here, let's start with some of those core tenets and presuppositions of both reformed theology and dispensational theology. What do the reformed believe? What do dispensationalists believe? Where do they differ? And, and, and so on. Now, to start off, I do realize that a lot more explanation of all of this is needed uh, than what I can give. But when we talk about reformed theology, we're really talking about covenant theology. Um, reformed theology certainly is about more than covenant theology, but reform theology is no less than being about covenant theology. Uh, while I recognize there are some exceptions and outliers to what I just said, reform theology and being about covenant theology, um, it, for instance, it's not that all reform theologians have bought into the whole system of covenant theology as a whole. John Murray is a famous example of a reform theologian who did not embrace the covenant of works as articulated. Uh, there are those outliers and there are, there are those exceptions, but the reality is a uh, reform theology and covenant theology go together like a hand uh, inside a glove. In fact, R.C. Sproul once said, reform theology is covenant theology. Now, we need to lay that out here clearly on the front end because I'm going to be quoting things about covenant theology and reform theology using the, thing, the terms interchangeably, and we need to know that this is the presupposition undergirding the presentation that Reform theology is covenant theology, so it's central. And at its core, what is covenant theology? Well, covenant theologians believe in the existence of certain theological covenants, um, extra-biblical covenants, through which God and his purpose and his program accomplishes salvation and redemption of the elect. That's important to stress here. Reformed theology, covenant theology, is very much focused on salvation, personal salvation, individual salvation. The central theme of scripture, according to the Reformed camp, is salvation, and specifically salvation through Christ. Here's how Wayne House says it. He says, covenant theologians have redemption as God's purpose in the world. Our own Mike Flock here says, covenant theology primarily is a soteriology system. It focuses on individual salvation and redemption. How Christ relates to soteriology is also much emphasized with covenant theology. In his day, Lewis Berry Schaefer said, in defining the eternal purpose of God, covenant theologians have advanced the theory that it is God's central purpose to save the elect, those chosen from eternity past. Accordingly, they view history as primarily the outworking of God's plan of salvation. Now, if I may, just a real brief side trail here. It's no wonder, to me at least, that, that those men uh, on the PhD side that are now promoting reform dispensationalism have had as a major focus of their academic writing and publication reform soteriology. These are men whose lives have been dedicated to studying the doctrine of soteriology. Dr. Riccardi's research interests are in particular redemption, the, the doctrine of limited atonement. Uh, Dr. Sammons is... Um, academic writings are in the field of the active obedience of Christ and, and the reprobation of the non-elect. So they have this interest already in soteriology, so there's no wonder that they'd be interested in seeing how reformed soteriology interacts with dispensationalism. So I'll get off my side trail here. Reformed theology more broadly, and then covenant theology, theology more specifically, um, it goes back to these theological covenants. That, that undergird the whole system. It's these three covenants by which Reformed theologians, covenant theologians, will explain that God's plan of redemption is being carried out. And then the, the three covenants we know are the, the covenant of works, the, the covenant of grace, and the covenant of redemption. Let's go through a real brief definition of each of those three covenants. Here's J.D. Fesco. He says, the covenant of works is God's agreement with Adam that he would grant him eternal life on the condition of his obedience to his commands, to fill the earth and subdue it, Genesis 1.28, and not to eat from the tree of knowledge, Genesis 2.16 and 17. Obedience would bring great blessing, but disobedience would bring death for Adam and his offspring. So that'd be one definition of the covenant of, of works. Blessings for obedience, 
uh, death for disobedience. Second is the covenant of grace. And we're using the Westminster Shorter Catechism to define this one. God, having out of his mere good pleasure from all eternity, elected some to everlasting life, did enter into a covenant of grace to deliver them out of the estate of sin and misery and to bring them into an estate of salvation by a redeemer. Note, with both covenants, the emphasis is salvation. Salvation of individual believers, salvation of the elect. And then third, we have the covenant of redemption, which may be defined, according to Burkhoff, as the agreement between the father, giving the son as head and redeemer of the elect, and the son voluntarily taking the place of those whom the father had given him. Now, it's, no to, 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 it's important to mention that these covenants are, are nowhere mentioned as such on the pages of Scripture. Not even in Hosea 6-7, which, which some will contend supports the covenant of works. I commend you to go listen to Dr. Gaiman's Bible Surgery podcast from, I think it was last week, where he uh, picks apart that argument skillfully. Uh, the covenants of covenant theolo theology are not biblical covenants. They are theological covenants. As Ryrie once noted, the theological covenants here are deductions, not inductions from scripture. The existence of the covenants is not found by an inductive examination of the passages. Okay, that's a bit about the individual theological covenants, which undergird this whole system of covenant theology. Now, it's, it's also important to note that covenant theology really didn't start to develop and, and become systematized until the, the 16th and 17th centuries, which is when it really started to take root post-Reformation in Switzerland and Germany eventually, before eventually being migrated to places like the Netherlands, England, and, and Scotland. Um, here's Lyle Bierma on that topic. He says it was only in the 16th and 17th century reformed Protestantism that the covenant concept came to be viewed as the thread that wove together the entire message of scripture. Now, I am again, painting with such broad brushstrokes here, it is important for me to note that there are within reformdom um, various different strands and flavors of, of reformed theology. You have reformed paedo-baptists, you have reformed credo-baptists, you have reformed folk who hold to the Westminster Confession, those who hold to the Belgian Confession, uh, you have those who hold to the London Baptist Confession, there are reformed Presbyterian, Presbyterians and reformed Baptists, so there's a huge argument happening on X right now about that very thing. But as I'm going to be claiming here today, I'm going to argue that there is no such thing as a reformed dispensationalist. That's a contradiction in terms. Uh, that's an oxymoron. That's a bridge too far. So that's a little bit about reformed theology and this inseparable link between reformed theology and covenant theology. What about dispensational theology? Uh, well, despite the name, the unfortunate name, I would say, anymore. Um, central to dispensational theology is not how many administrations or economies or dis dispensations one holds to, or how many dispensations a person sees in the pages of scripture. That's not a distinctive of dispensations. Um, yeah, here's a McCune on that very note. A particular number of dispensations is not an essential feature of dispensationalism. Now, in somewhat of an ironic twist, I would say, Though the number of dispensations one, one holds to is not an essential aspect of dispensational theology, covenants are. Covenants are an essential aspect of dispensationalism, holding the existence of the biblical covenants, uh, the Mosaic, the Davidic, the New, et cetera. That is an essential component of dispensationalism. Here's Dr. Pettigrew in that very subject. He says another possible good name for dispensationalism he's talking about here is biblical <laughs> covenantalism. Because this system is not built on the foundation of dispensations, but on the major biblical covenants, specifically the Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, and New. These biblical covenants form the backbone of what is usually called dispensationalism. So covenants, biblical covenants, are essential to dispensational theology. And what is at the core of dispensational theology, if you drill down to the center, is what Ryrie infamously called the sine qua non of dispensationalism, those, those three pillars of dispensational thought. I'm going to throw these up here. These are not verbatim, but a version of Ryrie's three pillars here. Pillar number one would be the recognition of the, the distinction between the nation of Israel and the church. The recognition of the distinction between the nation of Israel and the church. 
If the church in Israel, here's to saying, he says, if the church in Israel becomes so blurred in dispensationalism, there is no separation between them, dispensationalism will become as extinct as the pitied dodo bird. <laughs> He's right. Uh, Ryrie says, this is probably the most basic, basic theological test of whether or not a person is a dispensationalist, and it is undoubtedly the most practical and conclusive. The one who fails to distinguish Israel and the church consistently will inevitably not hold dispensational distinctions, and one who does will. Mal Couch says, dispensationalism is that biblical system of theology which views the word of God as unfolding, distinguishable economies in the outworking of the divine purposes for the nation of Israel in a distinct and separate manner from his purpose for the church. So a core tenet of dispensational theology is this recognition of the distinction between Israel and the church. Here's the second pillar, the consistent use, that word consistent is key there, of a single hermeneutic, namely the grammatical historical method. Here's Ryrie again. He says, consistently literal or plain interpretation indicates a, a dispensational approach to the interpretation of scripture. And I appreciate how Wayne House elaborates on that, that idea here. He says, when the scripture speaks of a lion lying down with the lamb, is it speaking of some deeper meaning or higher truth like peace in the world? Or does it mean, in fact, that, that the lion and the lamb will exist without hostility? When the scripture says that the prophet Elijah will return in the last days before the coming of the Messiah, was this fulfilled with John the Baptist? Or should the church expect the actual prophet to come? When the text states that the Messiah will actually descend to the Mount of Olives and that it will split into north and south, is this speaking of a higher principle of the Messiah's majesty, or will the real mountain east of Jerusalem be separated? When Zechariah the prophet spoke of a river at the, flowing at the temple, which goes into both the Mediterranean and Dead Seas, complete with descriptions and boundaries, does this refer merely to some spiritual truth? Is Ezekiel's temple only a weak description of Jesus, the temple of God? How Bible students, teachers, and pastors approach such ideas as these will reveal their commitment to natural interpretation of a text under a correspondence theory of truth. He's absolutely right. And indeed, even, even non-dispensationalists recognize that the consistent use of a grammatical historical hermeneutic is a hallmark of dispensational theology. For instance, O.T. Alice long ago said, literal interpretation has always been marked by a feature of premillennialism. In dispensationalism, it's been carried to an extreme. We have seen that this literalism found its most thoroughgoing expression in the claim that Israel must mean Israel, that it cannot mean the church, that the Old Testament prophecies regarding Israel concern the earthly Israel, and the church was a mystery unknown to the prophets and first made known to the apostle Paul. Or consider Glenn Creeder, who says dispensationalism, dispensationalism's innovation is not soteriological, that'd be covenant theology, but hermeneutical. All right, pillar number three uh, for dispensational theology. The recognition that the ultimate purpose of history is the glory of God through the demonstration that he alone is the sovereign God. Reynolds Showers says, covenant theology advocates the ultimate purpose of history is the glory of God through the redemption of the elect, salvation. By contrast, although dispensational theology recognizes that the redemption of elect human beings is a very important part of God's purpose for history, it is convinced that it is only one part of that purpose. The ultimate purpose of history has to be large enough to incorporate all of God's programs, not just one of them. Ryrie says to the normative dispensationalist, the soteriological or saving program of God is not only the program I think that should say not the only program, but one of the means God is using in the total program of glorifying himself. Scripture is not man-centered as though salvation were the main theme, but it is God-centered because his glory is the center. So to borrow from Reynolds Showers' famous book title, Is There a Difference? The answer is yes. There absolutely is a difference between dispensational theology and covenant theology. There's a difference between dispensational theology and Reformed theology. Okay, you might be thinking, okay, there's a difference. But who's to say that there can't be some sort of uh, merger or, or, or blending between these two different systems? Who are we to say that somebody can't be or can't call themselves a Reformed dispensationalist? 
Well, to get us closer to the heart of the matter, we need to spend some time now on studying the interaction between these two systems of theology historically. Because as I'm about to lay out here, though there are admittedly some points of historical intersection between dispensational theology and reformed theology, what we see is less, uh, what we see less of between these two is true overlap, where the two systems can work together on common ground. And what we see a lot more of is clashing because of how different these systems are and, and the presuppositions that underlie these two systems. Let's start with the overlap, the, the common ground, where I would actually find myself agreeing with the reformed dispensationalists that there's some interaction, legitimate interaction between the two. I would start by conceding that, that all dispensationalists are reformational. Note I didn't say reformed, I said reformational. Meaning like any Protestant believer today, a dispensationalist recognizes that his or her feet are, are planted in reformational soil. In fact, here are a few quotes, I think, that, that, highly, that, that helpfully highlight our reformational roots. Here's Roy Zuck who says, the Reformation was a time of social and ecclesiastical upheaval, but it was basically a hermeneutical reformation, a reformation in reference to the approach of the Bible. And reformers, as we look at the reformers themselves, we see that they were very clear and, and very faithful in various aspects of their hermeneutic. Like Luther says, the scriptures are to be retained in their simplest meaning ever possible and to be understood in their grammatical and literal sense unless the context plainly forbids. Zwingli says pulling a passage from its context is like breaking off a flower from its roots. Tyndale says scripture has but one sense, which is the literal sense. Were these men dispensationalists? Of course not. Uh, we can't anachronistically read back dispensational theology into men that lived long before it existed as a system. But there is a straight line that can be drawn from the original reformers hermeneutical commitments and methods to where we would sit as dispensationalists. Here's James Fazio on, on that very reality. He says that the Protestant Reformation called us back to the word of God and shows us what that looks like, especially though not exclusively in matters pertaining to soteriology. Dispensational thinkers have sought to exegete and apply God's word broadly throughout every area of theology and practice. In other words, not only in the realm of soteriology. Forged from the fires of the Reformation's heightened attention to the Bible and its details, a more refined and systematic dispensational understanding has developed and continues to be shaped. So we, we, we as dispensationalists have reformational soil that we're, we're planted in. We can even take that, that thought a step further and, and acknowledge that, that dispensationalism as a, as a recognized <coughs> theological system came not only out of historical reformational soil, but in its immediate origins, it actually developed in reformed circles. Uh, George Marsden notes, that dispensationalism was essentially reformed in its 19th century origins and had in later 19th century America spread most among revival-oriented Calvinists. Uh, Thomas Ice, Tommy Ice says it was almost exclusively within the reformed community that dispensationalism and later pre-tribulationism was seen as a more biblical counter to covenant theology. We think of Darby coming out of Presbyterianism, for instance. Now we shouldn't read too much into that fact. You know, Marston and Ice here are simply providing the historical snapshot of where the original dispensationalists came from, what they came out of. They aren't, like today's reformed dispensationalists, contending that the two systems now need to be merged. And they're, they're simply reporting the historical facts here that some of the earliest dispensationalists came out of Presbyterianism and more broadly speaking, the reformed world. But as we're about to see, theologians on both sides, dispensationalists and reformed, have spent many years now, many decades now, highlighting just how different these two systems of theology are and what odd bedfellows they make. For instance, here's uh, William Van Gemmeren, who chronicles here his, his own uh, migration from dispensationalism, that, that which he grew up in, to Reformed theology. And this is very uh, narrative-oriented. You're going to read the whole thing. It just gives you a feel for his own switch from dispensationalism to uh, reform theology, but I also want you to listen here to how he considers these two systems not to be mergeable, but completely different. 
He says, after I came to the United States in 1962, I remained committed to dispensational theology as best as I understood it. My studies at Moody Bible Institute opened up the theological and hermeneutical circle of dispensationalism. Most of my teachers were graduates of Dallas Theological Seminary and encouraged me to read widely. I spent many hours in extracurricular reading, Things to Come by Dwight Pentecost and the voluminous writings of Lewis Sperry Schaefer. While some of my questions were answered, others came to the surface. I devoured Charles Ryrie's Dispensationalism Today as it came out of the press. He settled some questions, but many lingered on. I extended my reading list to include Reformed theologians, including the Dutch theologians, notably Abraham Kuyper and Herman Bavink. They opened up a different approach to the Bible and to my unresolved theological and exegetical questions. I did not know the goal of my pilgrimage, but became more and more aware that I was leaving dispensationalism, however defined, for Reformed theology. So there's his story of how he went from one camp to the other, but the important point for our purposes, they're different camps. Or here's Keith Matheson, says dispensationalism differs from Reformed covenant theology in a number of ways, but the most significant is this idea of two peoples of God, Israel and the church. Covenant theology affirms that there is one people of God and thus continuity between the people of God in the Old Testament and the people of God in the New Testament. And here's Lyle Birma, who says, an aspect of dispensationalism that concerns Reformed Christians, and you can see by his Dutch last name, he's on the Reformed side, um, is its insistence that God always has and will have separate purposes for Israel and the church. According to this view, the history of redemption is about two distinct peoples and two divine plans. From a Reformed perspective, however, this represents a serious misreading of Scripture. The Bible, this is his Reformed perspective, is the story of one plan of God as it unfolds in one covenant of grace that he enters into with his one people. This Reformed, by the way, uh, discomfort with dispensationalism goes, goes way back. Here's Elizabeth Rickoff, who says, uh, speaking of dispensational premillennialism in his day, says a, a new philosophy, he calls a new philosophy of the history of redemption in which Israel plays a leading role and the church is but an interlude. He also said this theory is based on a literal interpretation of the prophetic delineations of the future of Israel and of the kingdom of God, and he says it's entirely untenable. Another favorite of the Reformed crowd would be Lorraine Bettner, who wrote the Reformed Doctrine of Predestination. And according to Bettner, oops, while well, historical premillennial pre pre millenarianism is a much less erroneous system than that is of dispensationalism, it is only wishful thinking, which assumes that the two can logically be separated and kept in watertight compartments. The two systems are basically the same and must stand or fall together. And Bettner wanted both to fall. He didn't want either around. Now, here's a more modern figure in Reformed theology. Michael Horton says, dispensational exegesis strikes me as imposing a rigidly literalistic scheme on particular passages. So these are all Reformed folk highlighting these, these night and day differences between Reformed theology and dispensational theology. And of course, and many of you who have been around the block for a while, you know that that, that apex mountain of this, um, this tension, this conflict between dispensational theologians and Reformed theologians would be John Gerstner's book in 1991, Wrongly Dividing the Word of Truth, which was really his, his screed, his, his attack on dispensational theology. The book reads like he got into a fight with his wife the night before and took it out of the dispensationalists <laughs> as he went about writing. Uh, he really got the flamethrower out for this one. But um, this book, Wrongly Dividing the Word of Truth, is, is all, it's a Biden critique of dispensationalism. And he purports, purports to be speaking for the Reformed tradition in this book. And he says things like this. And we know that Gerstner, by the way, was Arson Sproul's mentor. So he had a profound impact on Sproul who has continued to have a profound in influence on Christendom in general. He says, my plea to all dispensationalists is this, show me the fundamental error in what I teach or admit your own fundamental error. We cannot both be right. One of us is wrong, seriously wrong. And he knows who's wrong. Because he says dispensationalism today, as yesterday, is dubious evangelicalism. He says so much more. There's so much heat in this book, I couldn't quote it all. Uh, he says, Dis dispensationalism is rather short on theory and long on practice. 
That is, it sees itself as a biblical theology at heart and gets to the Bible as quickly as it can. I'm good with that. <laughs> Consequently, it says relatively little regarding theological method, philosophy, natural theology, and other introductory matters which are in traditional dogmatics discussed under the rubric of prolegomena. About hermeneutics, however, he's still talking about dispensationalism here, it says far more than necessary. That is, as we shall show later, it raises a virtual non-issue to a level of prime importance. Did you catch what he's saying there? That matters of hermeneutics, the hermeneutics that we hold to so dearly as dispensationalists, as, as biblicists from the previous presentation, he calls them a virtual non-issue. I don't know about you, but I would say that hermeneutics is the final issue. It's the kind of thing you go to, to war for, you, you, you die for. I mean, that's an essential issue, a first-rate issue. How do you think the reformers, on whose shoulders Gerstner would say he was standing, would respond to his contention here that hermeneutics, biblical interpretation, is a virtual non-issue? Again, Gerstner's protege was the, the highly regarded R.C. Sproul of Ligonier Ministries, and who himself would be thought of by many as, as really the standard bearer for Reformed theology in the 20th, late 20th, early 21st centuries. And even Sproul, in the foreword to Gerstner's book, recognized that there's a, there's a qualifier here to this quote, that, that if Gerstner's claims were to win out, dispensationalism should be disregarded as being a serious deviation from biblical Christianity. I bring all this up because if we're being honest with the facts of church history, if we're being honest with the scholarship, both on the reform side and the dispensational side, we have to be willing to recognize that there is a massive rift, a massive chasm, and necessarily so, that exists between reform theology and dispensationalism. There's a rift and a chasm that, that parties on both sides have historically recognized. That is, I guess, until now, with the advent of, of so-called reformed dispensationalism. Now, before I get to the words here of, of Matthew Johnston and, and Drs. Riccardi and, and Sammons, please indulge me to go on one more side trip, okay? As dispensationalists, we, we actually have precedent for a move of this sort within the dispensational camp. It wasn't all that long ago, and, and I know that the parallels break down in certain ways, it was maybe, what, 35 or so years ago that progressive dispensationalism what was being introduced within dispensationalism as a variant of some of the more traditional classical models of dispensational thought. And the progressive dispensational movement led by men like Craig Blasing, Daryl Bach, uh, Sosi out at, Tal at Talbot, it engendered a good amount of, of pushback from the classic traditional dispensationalists. Conferences were held, papers were written, books were published, all sorts of uh, conversations were being had to address the concerns that people were having about this new breed of, of dispensationalism called progressive dispensationalism. Now, one major issue that was being wrestled over as progressive dispensationalism was being introduced was whether progressive dispensationalism, dispensationalism was a development within dispensationalism or instead it was a change. Charles Ryrie, who was right in the middle of these, these discussions, said this, development and change are not synonymous, but have different meanings. And he's right, think about it. Uh, if, you're, if you go on a diet, or your spouse goes on a diet, or your spouse is in the middle of a, a job change, that's a development in your marriage. A change would be like divorce papers are being served. It, there's a whole change in the relationship now. See the difference between development and change. Now, Richard Mao was not a dispensationalist, but he was able to see that progressive dispensationalism was not a development, but was a change. I note his reaction here. He says, dispensationalism is changing. I've read the progressive dispensationalist, and as a reformed thinker, I can only applaud their reformulation of dispensational thought. When the newer dispensationalists reject a uniquely dispensational hermeneutic, when they affirm the organic continuities between Israel and the, and the church, I can only say, amen. Here's Keith Matheson, 
also speaking in this era of the, the advent of progressive dispensationalism, he's asking here for clarity on what's actually happening around him. He says the church suffers too much damage when people do not identify what they really believe. For the sake of accuracy, honesty, and understanding, progressive dispensationalists should no longer claim to be dispensational. Traditional dispensationalists would likely concur. Do most dispensational laymen realize that the dispensationalism now taught in their seminaries is not the dispensationalism they knew? As much as I prefer to see reformed theology, these reformed, taught in these seminaries, if someone is going to teach non-dispensationalism in a dispensational seminary, students and donors should at least be aware of the fact. Now, I'm not here to quibble over progressive versus traditional. That's not the topic today. That's not what I'm here for. But note how Matheson here is asking for honesty about what is actually happening, about the changes that are being, being brought about. Matheson also touched on the reality, though, as we see here in his language, and this gets back to the main point of this presentation, that Reformed theology and dispensationalism are two different systems. He, he wants Reformed theology to be taught in the Senate. It's not dispensational theology. The point, though, is that those who were wrestling with these matters of progressive dispensationalism 30 to 35 years ago, is it development, is it change, is back to where we are today when we address Reformed dispensationalism. I've taken like 45 minutes of my hour to just tee up the question, uh, to delay the inevitable. Um, we do need to go to the original sources here and hear from the uh, Reformed dispensationalists themselves. And what I'm going to share with you now are, are a series of quotes with, with some minimal com co color commentary by myself uh, from those who are pushing for this idea of Reformed dispensationalism. And to get us started, Let's look at some of the statements of these men and how they view the theological covenants of Reformed theology and how they think there's an integration that can happen between embracing those covenants and being a dispensationalist. Here's Peter Sammons. He says, you can be a dispensationalist and affirm one, two, three, or any of the covenants of covenant theology. So I don't think that dispensationalists have to be afraid of using those terms. Here's Mike McCartney. He says, the truths that are seeking to be denominated by the terms covenant of redemption, covenant of works, covenant of grace, I think those are truths that don't strike at any essential tenet of dispensationalism. But as we've looked at earlier, the covenants of covenant theology strike right at the heart of dispensationalism. They, they come from an entirely different, indeed a competing system of theology, which is inconsistent with its application of, of literal grammatical and historical hermeneutics which minimizes, if not obliterates, that distinction between the church and Israel, and which sees the scripture through an entirely different lens, namely the, that of individual personal salvation through Christ. Well, perhaps knowing that these arguments might be coming, uh, the Reformed dispensationalists next, they, they pivot to, to church history, and namely to, to church history in the Reformed tradition to show that there were some Reformed theologians who did have certain futuristic takes on Israel. The idea here would be what we're suggesting here isn't new. It could, in fact, it goes back to the, the pre-post-Reformation era where men like John Owen and Wilhelmus Abrakel were, were saying futuristic things about Israel. Here's uh, Peter Sammons again. He says, so the criticism comes. If you embrace the covenant of redemption, covenant of works, and so on, you are admitting certain hermeneutical moves that if you were to practice them consistently would get you to say that Israel is the church, the church is Israel, and it would undo this land promise and the kingdom promise. And my point is, well, evidently not for Owen, meaning John Owen, and evidently not for Brockle. Owen didn't choose between the two, and Brockle didn't choose between the two. I don't think I'm choosing between the two. Here's Matthew Johnston the host of the podcast, he says, even the Puritans, who are certainly seen by most as kind of the, path, the bastions and protectors of Calvinistic and Reformed theology, certainly allowed for various views regarding the millennial kingdom and how that is to be interpreted. And here's Johnston again. He says, you get people like John Murray, who is quite opposed to dispensationalism, believing in a future for an ethnic Israel, and hear people like Michael Horton saying similar things as well. So there is a lot of crossover in that sort of subject. That, really, that doesn't really distinguish one or the other, does it? So as we put this all together, and as we weigh it, we, we find that one of the 
the planks of the reformed dispensationalist platform is that because we find certain reformed theologians from history acknowledging the scriptures teachings about certain future oriented realities that there's a possibility here of a broader merger of the two systems hence reformed dispensationalism but i would say that's actually saying too much while proving too little any one of us could grab an outlier in various theological camps and say see this means i'm right and this means you're wrong you know s lewis johnson a dispensationalist infamously embraced all five points of Calvinism, but that doesn't didn't make him reformed. Um, John Murray, we mentioned earlier, rejected the covenant of works, but that didn't make him a dispensationalist. Uh, and I'll say this later, but the fact that uh, Puritans of various stripes might have seen in various instances, instances a future for Israel, that certainly didn't make them dispensationalists. I might, it, Puritans are wonderful to read for, for devotional purposes, but let's not grab our hermeneutics from them. Moving on, in addition to church history, uh, the Reformed Dispensationalists have also, I think, taken a page from the playbook of the Progressive Dispens Dispensationalists of 30 to 35 years ago. You, may, you remember I just mentioned how there's that distinction that had to be drawn back in those days between development and change. And how this whole idea of progressive dis dispensationalism had to be evaluated. Was it a development or was it an actual change? And how those in the traditional camp were pushing back on the progressives and saying, you need to be honest, this is, if this is change, say that it's change. Well, the reformed dispensationalists of today seem to have a, a, a degree of sensitivity to this issue because they are going out of their way in, in their public statements, like the progressives before them, to indicate that they're they're not changing anything. This is more, they'll say, about development. This is more about harmony. Here's Peter Samantin, and he says, I think it is a matter of harmony, even sometimes more than hermeneutics. And then he says, I just want to create space to see that, you know, there is indeed a lot of overlap. And then he says, there are dispensationalists who are sort of, they cut themselves off from some of the blessings of the biblical truths behind it, like doctrines, like theological covenants, the reformed theology, and there are guys who have moved to reject certain, I think, dispensational truths because they saw the truth of those other things and said, oh, I can't have them both. I actually think you can have them both. You can have your cake and eat it too by calling yourself a reformed dispensationalist. But the point I've been trying to make in this presentation, especially with all the groundwork that, that we laid at the beginning, is that, that no, you can't. The systems are, are simply too divergent and too different and, and at their core, with the presuppositions that, that undergird each. And as we continue to read on, we see that no matter how much the Reformed Dispensationalist group now is trying to soften the blow of what they're saying by saying this is just a, a development, this is about harmony, not, not, not hermeneutics, um, that's undercut by the fact that to embrace what they're promoting would actually require embracing radical change because of some of the, the broad and the sweeping statements they're making, that it's not only possible, but, but necessary for a dispensationalist to embrace certain aspects of reformed or covenant theology. And, and if, if somebody was to embrace what I'm about to, to list off for you, you'd have to really question whether they've called themselves a dispensationalist anymore. Here's Peter Sammons. He says, there's also other principles in covenant theology that we have to affirm in order to be faithful Christians. And that's part of the thing I think we oftentimes miss in the dispensational circles, is that we all affirm that man owes God obedience because we are creatures made in his image. Well, we could pause now and say, of course, we would affirm that, that we are created by God and owe God obedience. We can find that in the Bible, Bible passages. We don't need a covenant to tell us that. And he goes on and says, and the way Thomas Watson and William Ames defined it, so here are his sources, the covenant of works is that man owes God obedience personally perpetually and perfectly, right? That's how they define the covenant of works ultimately. So principally, we would all affirm the truths of the covenant of works. You must affirm that to be a Christian, that man owes God obedience. There's no Christian who has ever lived who denies that principle. Those things are very vital to our Christian faith. Sammons is also very strong on his views of the, of the doctrine of the act of obedience of Christ, um, he's written on that academically. That was his THM thesis. 
He says, I think of those dispensationalists who don't like the act of obedience of Christ, which grieves me because I mean, the act of obedience of Christ is, I mean, it's hard to understand how you don't say that that's fundamental to the gospel. I don't have time to get into this right now, but Dr. Pettigrew in his chapter, one of his chapters in Forsaking Israel, which might be one of the free books today, um, highlights how that doctrine of the act of obedience of Christ, um, given its moorings in covenant theology, is actually one to be very cautious about. I'll mention one more here in terms of quoting the words of these men themselves, which is that though they call themselves reformed dispensationalists, when you evaluate the language that they've used, at least so far in promoting this new theological movement, these new theological ideas, it does seem that they are more concerned with upholding the reformed side of that moniker than the dispensational side. Now, I know they have to, in the case of Dr. Sammons and Dr. Riccardi, wave proudly the dispensational flag. They're employed by the Master Seminary, and as a condition of their employment at dispensational seminary, they have to affirm that seminary statement of faith. So they are saying they're dispensationalists. Praise God for that. But as you hear their words, and as you see the words on the screen here, note that there's real emphasis on the reform side of their reform dispensationalism. Here's Mike Riccardi. He says, we are reform teachers, theologians, whatever, who are also dispensational in our understanding of the kingdom of hermeneutics of Israel, rather than being squarely within a dispensational system who just also happen to be Calvinistic. Note the priority there. We are reformed teachers who happen to be dispensational about these other items, like the kingdom and the millennium and such. Uh, here's Peter Sammons. We're not just five-point Calvinists. We're reformed in a broader perspective doctrine than just the five points. In other words, we're, we're beyond where John MacArthur would say as being a Calvinistic dispensationalist. We're, we're more broadly and committedly reformed. We're Calvinists, but we're reformed Calvinists. And we know that Dr. Sammons is, is open about his... Um, adherence to the 1689 London Baptist Confession. So we're confessional reformed Calvinists. Andy Woods, a dispensationalist, once said this about progressive dispensationalism. He said, progressive dispensationalists are those attempting to find a middle ground between traditional dispensationalism and covenant theology and their desire to build a bridge to reform theology. And what Woods was saying there about progressive dispensationalism is directly in line with what's being attempted, I believe, with reformed today dispensationalism. Here's Dr. Sammons again. He says, reformed dispensationalism is sort of a way of saying, is not our brand of, or, or of doctrine, our understanding of reformed theology coupled with that understanding of Israel and hermeneutical commitments, is that not compatible at least, you know, obviously acknowledging distinctions, but compatible enough to say that we can wear the moniker reformed as well and have these distinctions, distinctives. There it is. There's that supposed bridge between these competing systems of theology, the supposed bridge to use Woods' term to reformed theology. But in this next quote I'm gonna show you, we're gonna see once again that this is a bridge too far. I've already put this up here, but this is from Andrew Young, who serves as Matthew Johnston's associate pastor there in New Zealand, where he says, every self-respecting dispensationalist should consider themselves a covenant theologian. Man, that would, I think, establish for us that reformed dispensationalism is more than a development. And a statement like that marks change, real change. Um, Mike Riccardi, building on that, and advocating for reform dispensationalism, he says, people regard those things. And his reference there is reform theology and dispensationalism. People regard those things as inherently mutually exclusive. They'll say, you know, to be reformed is to be non-dispensational. To be dis dispensational is to be non-reformed. They're mutually exclusive. They're oxymorons to put them together. I think I've actually used those very words here today. Um, Riccardi, with the tone and the, and the language here, you can see he obviously doesn't see it that way which is why he's promoting this whole idea of reform dispensationalism. Well, apparently in response to the very podcast that I've been quoting from today, R. Scott Clark, who teaches church history at Westminster Seminary in California, has himself replied to this whole notion of reform dispensationalism. He's coming at it from the reformed angle, I'm coming at it from the dispensational angle. He says, one might perhaps speak of reforming dispensationalism in the sense of reorganizing it or changing it internally. 
But if by reformed dispensationalism, one intends to indicate a synthesis of dispensational theology with reformed theology, it is impossible. It is an oxymoron, a contra contradiction in terms. By the way, our Scott Clark and I don't see eye to eye on much. Um, we both hail from the state of Nebraska now. He's a Husker fan, as am I, but that's where the comparisons end. Um, he is a avowedly reformed theologian, and he's been very open about his objections to dispensationalism. But again, here's him saying this idea of reformed dispensationalism, from the reformed perspective, it doesn't work. So he and I are so different, but we land in the same place. To say that reformed dispensationalism doesn't work, it's not a thing. It's inherently contradictory. I'll give you one more critique of reformed dispensationalism from the reform side. This is from Lincoln Duncan. Um, and believe it or not, this is from 30 years ago, proving that he was uh, prescient as he said this, these things. He wrote, there is no one on either side of the dispensational covenant theology debate who would say, well, both of these sides are half right. We just sort of need to combine the two of them. He's saying there's no one who would ever say that. Uh, they are diametrically opposed at so many points that it would be hopeless to attempt to come up with sort of a hybrid of dispensational and covenant theology. And that's really at the heart of my critique here this morning uh, of, of those who are advocating today reformed dispensational dispensationalism. Uh, they're lobbying to create this sort of hybrid Frankenstein-like theological creature that was never supposed to be built. It, it's one thing, again, to, to love the writings of the reformers from a devotional standpoint. It's one thing to have one's um, heart inflamed by the devotional writings of the Puritans and, and, and the Reformation era guys. And I know guys like Dr. Riccardi and Sammons, that has happened for them. It, it's one thing to appreciate reformational theology to the extent it actually stands on the shoulders of the reformers themselves. But it's quite another thing as dispensationalists to say that we need to adopt these certain core tenets of reformed theology, this completely different system, this antithetical system, to be somehow more faithful in our understanding of God and, and his word. Again, I've mentioned these things, not to pick a fight uh, with any of the men I've mentioned today, but who knows where it goes. Um, it is not to, to uh, wield some sort of axe that I have to grind with TMS. I have no such axe. You know, this is about having a commitment to the correct theological methods and to, to stick with correct theological methods, which I hope I've articulated is what we should all be doing here this morning. And to look at new concepts, new theological approaches to scripture with one eyebrow raised and some caution, and also to realize and to be honest, even if it makes us unpopular, that, that certain theological systems and groups and pairings just can't be paired together so easily as we might want to think. Uh, some bridges don't need to be built, and some bridges can't be built. 12 o'clock. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for these men. Thank you for their, again, their love for you, their love for the truth of your word, and their love for the people that they've been charged to present your word to. I do pray that uh, this message has been, again, just one to get us to be thinking about all the different theological discourse that is happening out there. Back in the days of Gutenberg, it was the printing press and all the ways that, that theological uh, ideas were being circulated and, and, and moved around. Today, it's simply one's thumbs and one's recording studio that, that leads to theological ideas being shared. And I just pray that we would be discerning and we would be wise, that we would take all of our thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ as he has revealed truth in, in the word. Be with these men the rest of this day. Strengthen them for service. And may be glorified through our ministries in Jesus' name. Amen.